Jesus on the way, and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified, and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I am. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Bible trivia question for everybody on this third Sunday of Easter. What was Jesus' last name? What was the last name of Jesus? How many of you think it's a trick question? All right, you're correct. All right, very good. All right? It's a trick question. All right? When we say Jesus Christ, we're not saying that that's his last name. That's the title that he was given. Christ, right? maybe another Bible trivia question. Does anybody know what Christ means? It's a Greek word. It means the anointed one, right? So at the Easter Vigil a couple of weeks ago, we anointed with chrism oil those who had been baptized and those who were confirmed. So Christ comes from a Greek word meaning to anoint, or the Hebrew word Messiah, right? Which is something else that many of us are familiar with. So throughout the scriptures, and throughout the Old Covenant, leading up to the days of Jesus, there was many different prophecies, there were many different prophecies about the one who was to come, the one who was to be the anointed one, the Christ, or the Messiah, or the Savior. And you've probably heard that many of the people at the time of Jesus, they were shocked by his ministry, and they were shocked by his death, because they were expecting him to be a great military leader. You guys have probably heard that, right? You know, it's pretty common for people to hear that, especially if you ever do a, you know, just kind of a basic level Bible study. When I was in high school and I did my first Bible study, that was one of the first things I learned, is that people are expecting a military Messiah, somebody who is going to lead a revolt against the Roman Empire. That's one of the reasons why around the time of Jesus there were many different Jewish revolts. There was a man named Bar Kokhba, for example, right, the son of the star, and he led a revolt. And so people were surprised when Jesus did not you know, lead, a, lead a military revolt. He didn't establish an army, and in fact, when he died. And so, of course, that's what we've heard about today in today's gospel. When the disciples who were walking with Jesus on their way to Emmaus... They were explaining to him how surprised and devastated they were that this man who they thought was the Christ had died. And so, of course, Jesus opened up the scriptures to them. And he said this very interesting thing. He said, thus it was written, it was written that the Christ would suffer and die. How could Jesus say that? It's a question that you may have thought of this morning as you were reflecting on the readings. Why would Jesus say that if everybody was expecting a military Messiah? The answer is actually that it's a little bit more complicated than that. In the days of Jesus, there was lots of division about what people expected the Messiah to be like. 
As you all know from your times at Mass and hearing these readings from the Bible, there were different sections, different sects of Jews. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees that we hear all about in the Gospels. They were always criticizing Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't agree on everything. The Sadducees were like the conservative party who was in control. And the Pharisees were considered to be more liberal. And so there was great animosity between those two groups. And then there were also the Essene Jews. John the Baptist, he was an Essene Jew. You probably heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered at a, an Essene monastery outside the Dead Sea. And the Essenes, they didn't agree with the Pharisees or the Sadducees. You had the Zealot Jews. The Zealots were the ones who were most expecting this military messiah to come, and so they were always trying to stir up rebellion and a revolt amongst the people. What I'm trying to say is that there was a lot of mystery. There were a lot of questions about what it would be like when the messiah would come. Some people thought he would be a military hero because they knew that many of the prophets said that he would be like King David was. And David was the greatest liberator in Israel's history. He had fought off the Philistines. He had conquered many different armies. And so people thought if the Messiah was going to be like him, maybe, maybe he will also be a great soldier. But many of the prophets, they also talked about the Messiah being like a new Moses. And so that's one of the reasons why when Jesus came on the scene, he kept saying, you have heard Moses say, but I say, he was taking the place of Moses. Instead of continuing the old Passover that Moses had established, Jesus began a new Passover. It wasn't always clear what people were expecting. And it actually is still a little bit relevant today. Right? I'm sure many of you are familiar that uh, one of the big divides between Catholics and Protestants is how many books are in our Bibles. The reason why Catholics have more books in our Bible is because even in the days of Jesus, there was no set canon of the Old Testament. All the different sects of Jews, they had different numbers of books in their Old Testament. And so what happened in the early days of the church is the church basically had to choose one of those Old Testament canons. And in the days of Martin Luther, he thought that the early church had done that incorrectly. And so he took those books out. They're books of the Old Testament, not of the New Now, what I think is most interesting about what Jesus said is that, again, he said that the Christ was going to suffer. And it's true. If you read the Old Testament, you read some of the prophecies, it talks about the suffering that would happen when the Messiah would come. When John the Baptist was arrested and killed, Jesus told his disciples that it was to fulfill the scriptures. But it was still mysterious. Prophecies are always mysterious. That's why we should be skeptical nowadays when you see televangelists on TV telling you about how all these prophecies are being fulfilled in Russia or the President or the United Nations. We should always be skeptical. Prophecies are more mysterious than that. But it is true that many of the prophets talked about the suffering of the Messiah, and the reason was simple. It had to do with the establishment of the Old Covenant. When God established his covenant with his people Israel on Mount Sinai and then again at Mount Ebal, he told the people of Israel that he would be faithful to them forever. And the people of Israel, they promised that they would be faithful to God forever as well. And what happened throughout the rest of salvation history? People of Israel were unfaithful. And so when they had made that covenant, the people of Israel had promised fidelity and that if they had become unfaithful, there would be a number of punishments or curses that would come down upon them. And so when the people of Israel were unfaithful, they became like criminals in the eyes of the covenant. And so the people of Israel knew that in order for them to get out of that place of punishment, there had to be a way of making amends with the covenant and fidelity that they had committed. Jesus, 
When he came, he himself took those punishments upon himself on the cross. He stood in the place of the condemned party and received those punishments, those curses. The letter to the Galatians says that cursed is a man who hangs on a tree. St. Paul was saying that Jesus took the place of the condemned criminal so that you and I might no longer be considered criminals. But sons and daughters and friends. In order for that reconciliation to take place, the punishment had to be endured. And Christ, in his mercy, chose to take it upon himself. He was like the lamb who was led to the slaughter. He was the one who was pierced. He was the one who became cursed for us. That is why Jesus could tell the apostles that they should have already known that it had been written that Christ would have to suffer. And on the third day, he would rise.